Hello, everybody. Welcome. We are going to start our women in business panel, so I'd appreciate it if everyone could take a seat. I'd like to also invite our esteemed panelists up onto the stage um, to take their seats as well. So first, we have with us Dr. Rajan Bhatharai, the advisor to the Prime Minister on Foreign Affairs. Next, I would like to invite Dr. Bimala Rai Paudial, Honorable Minister of Parliament in the Upper House, followed by Mr. Srini Nagarajan, Managing Director and Head of CDC South Asia. Please, just take a seat. Yeah. Next, I'd like to invite Mr. Siddhant Raj Pandey, Chairman and CEO of Business Oxygen, an IFC-funded private equity investor here in Nepal, followed by Ms. Melody Liang Yin, Manager of the Asian Region for China Power Construction Company. And last but not least for our panelists, Ms. Anupama Kunjeli, CEO of Mega Bank. This event uh, would not have been possible without um, the South Asian Women's Development Forum and the Department for International Development. So on behalf of SODF, I would like to invite Ms. Pramila Rijlal, founder and president of SODF, to open this event. Distinguished speakers and a very special guest present here at the Women in Business session. A very warm welcome to you all. And this session is focused, and it happened in the last hour. I have to share this because the program that we have designed was an 11th hour planning. And it was the initiation of South Asian Women Development Forum and DFID. DFID has been playing a very important role in such events. And SODF has had the pleasure to partner with, SODF, uh, with DFID since the last couple of years. And they have also been supporting our flagship program, the International Women Entrepreneurs Summit. South Asian Women Development Forum is a regional organization represented by 27 organizations in the SARC region, and we work on promoting women entrepreneurship. Let me start with what late Kofi Annan, former UN Secretary General and Nobel Peace Prize winner said, there is no tool for development more effective than the empowerment of women. But despite this, to date, there has been a huge gender disparity between women and men-owned businesses. Why is that so? When we talk about business, we know there are challenges and opportunities. But there are very gender-specific challenges when it comes to women doing business. And this is something we have to look into. So women's participation in business activities is a must. It is time we see economics from a gender lens. We are also aware of the challenges that women face, and we've talked about very specific challenges, such as low productivity, sectors, you know, and less level of business education, underpaid, and how growth sectors, in other words, underrepresentation of women in the formal economy. To me, it is the mindset. That is something that we have to change, and if we do not have the perspective change, this goes on. 
and the most effective and powerful way to empowerment of women economically is right to property. Ownership is something that we cannot deny. And here, I would like to talk a little bit about what ownership is. And this is a reality-based story. This is an article which is out in the Kantipur daily. And this is a story of many women. And I'm going to share one story of Goma Devi Tamang from Helambu VDC. Goma Devi got married to become a wife, daughter, and a mother. She realized the family was hers, and so was the house, but had no legal right to property. But Women's Day was a very special day for her, and it was a turning point, because she and her husband acquired joint land ownership, a campaign of Nepal government. And I would like to quote her in her own words. What she says is, the hard work has finally paid off, and the property ownership has given equal rights to both of us. She says her social and legal status has been enhanced. This is a story of not one woman. There are stories which is in all sectors. And the title is very beautiful. It says, your and mine equal soil. So the reality is that, be it a woman farmer, basket weaver, business leader, or a CEO in the corporate world, ownership of property, legal right in property, is the passage to economic empowerment. Today, we have among us a very distinguished and power-driven panelist representing different sectors. I'm confident there will be some key takeaways from their perspective, hearing their perspective. And now, I would also like to hand over the floor to Suva Subramaniam, the moderator of this session. Suva Subramaniam is the head of private sector development at Nathan London and is the economist for the design of a DFID funded women's economic empowerment program in Nepal. She has designed and implemented large scale private sector programs in business linkages, business development services, and in challenge funds across Asia and Africa. She has led public private partnerships, driven lead firm business engagement, and designed innovative mobile enabled real time monitoring and evaluation programs for large businesses and MSMEs. Ms. Suba has a degree in economics from the London School of Economics and a master's degree in public policy from Harvard University. Suba, the floor is yours. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Pramilaji, for that excellent uh, introduction and for setting out what is happening in Nepal today. Um, as Pramila mentioned, we are very excited to hold this first ever Women's Economic Empowerment Panel at the Nepal Investment Summit. I think that in itself marks a huge step forward to get this very important issue on the agenda. Before we introduce our panelists, let me explain the format of today's event. We have a bit of a short time, um, so we will be opening the panel directly with questions and discussion for about half an hour, and then we will open it to the floor for 15 minutes of uh, audience question and answer. So start thinking of your questions, and then a wrap up. We also have a high tea after the event at the Garden Cafe, so uh, all of you will be invited to continue the discussion there afterwards. And we will also be live tweeting the discussion. So I urge you to uh, join the conversation online with the hashtags invest in Nepal and uh, women in business. There will also be a report produced on this event, which will showcase the insights of our panelists and take forward the conversation. So let me turn now to our exciting panelists today, um, six of them who are eminent leaders in their field. I'm not sure I can do full justice to their full experience, but their bios are available on the summit website, so you can find out more the, about them. 
We have with us Dr. Rajan Bhatharai, Foreign Affairs Advisor to the Prime Minister, Dr. Bimala Rai, Honorable Minister of Parliament in the Upper House, Mr. Srini Rag uh, Nagarajan, uh, Managing Director and Head of CDC South Asia, Mr. Siddhant Raj Pandey, Chairman and CEO of Business Oxygen, an IFC-funded private equity investor here in Nepal, Ms. Melody Liang Yin, Manager of the Asian Region for China Power Construction Company, and last but certainly not least, again, Ms. Anupama Kunjeli, CEO of Megabank. So let us begin. Um, I'd like to start by hearing about where we are today in Nepal in terms of the general agenda of women's ec economic empowerment from our government representatives. Nepal, as we know, has very progressive legislation in terms of tax breaks, subsidies for women-owned businesses, as well as, of course, the minimum 33% representation of women in parliament. So let me begin, Dr. Rajan, with you. What is the state of the current policy environment today regarding uh, women's economic empowerment, and is there a gap between the policy and the reality on the ground? I can speak from here, right? Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Shubha. And good uh, afternoon, everybody. I think when we discuss about the women's empowerment, let me first clarify the one point that we cannot miss, and the present government, Prime Minister himself, like to, whenever we talk this topic, to include the women's participation in each and every sector. I would not like to reiterate the legislative procedure, I mean the provisions and the constitutional provisions that we have made. That's what our facilitator just mentioned about it. To translate whatever provisions in our constitutions and in our legislation into the practice, we are now first developing a sort of laws. Many laws we have passed, and if you look on those laws, you will find some of, the, some of the mandatory provisions that need to be implemented in our practice. Second thing, the government has introduced the President's Women's Advancement Programs. That was announced in our last budget pro, uh, policy and programs and also includes into the budgetary practices. And through it, and also some of the other initiatives, we have taken some of the policy, uh, policy levels programs that includes like establishment of women's entrepreneurship development fund so that the fund can be lend, lended to those who are interested to start up their own business and their own programs. That includes organizing trainings as well as concessional loans that is one program that the government has taken in, in, in our last annual budget. The second programs we have also established one, you might, I think Anupamaji is a member of it also, establishment of a business promotion and uh, interaction council that is headed by the prime minister himself, where we have also included a included couple of women's as a member of that uh, high level, highest level business promotion council so that we can also listen or hear the problems as well as the, you know, the, uh, the issue that directly come to the prime minister's table. It does not have to go through the whole, you know, the different layers of the bureaucracy. The third one we have also initiated in the last uh, year, that is women's entrepreneurship start of funds so that that start of funds can be provided to each women who are interested to do the uh, inter I mean the, to engage into the business so that is another programs I may taking I, I may be taking long time so <laughs> I will not go that detail but there is a, another program that goes to the all the 77 districts that call micro enterprise development program for poverty allevi alleviations that is in all the 77 districts and where the group they form, there has to be 70% of women. So that only that, this is the sort of mandatory provisions that the women's, uh, I mean the, the programs that allow, allowed only to operate if they have 70% women's participation. 
Apart from this, there are a number of other initiatives. I will not go detail because this forum also you may know so in, to some extent in your practice better than me. There are also some tax rebate provisions uh, to encourage women to take part in the uh, business. Same way, we have also, you know, recently, each village, the government is going to develop a village uh, promotion, I mean, the business promotion center, something like that. And that programs where the government is going to introduce the mandatory provisions of women's participation into the local level as we have in the local body bodies. So these are the some of these programs that the, since last year the government, I mean the formation of this new government we have taken up and the government is committed that without the participation, active participation of 51% of population, the, you know, the broader goal of our, you know, achieving prosperous Nepal, happy Nepali, that goal we cannot achieve. So our focus and our, you know, area, they need to be addressed and we are ready to address that the government's message I would like to convey to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rajan. I'm going to be turning to Dr. Bimala. Um, I think Dr. Rajan was speaking about the, the breadth and the innovation in, the, in terms of the legislation. But still, what do you think are some of the challenges that women face in the private sector? And, and you know, another question is, is there a gap between the legislation in place and the reality on the ground? Um, yeah, uh, first of all, uh, namaste and good afternoon, everyone. I'm so privileged to be here to, to share some of my views uh, regarding the challenges. I just to start from the point of where uh, Dr. Patrai um, left us. Uh, there are a number of um, good uh, schemes that government of Nepal has uh, designed uh, to empower women economically um, since few decades, especially, especially the last decades has been um, changed uh, decades, decades were changed in many aspects on women's empowerment. Um, I see a lot of eminent, eminent uh, women uh, entrepreneurs here in front of me uh, who, know, who know much better than me about the challenges. But what I have seen uh, from the position that I uh, am now uh, is that a lot of good schemes, a lot of good policies, they reach, they, either they do not reach to the potential women who are interested in inter entrepreneurship, and when they reach to the few, um, with information, it's very hard to access to those uh, schemes. Um, there are a lot of uh, uh, challenges, be it, I see a lot of big challenges is administrative hurdles um, to, to access to those uh, schemes and uh, those provisions. So the information and uh, administrative procedures uh, need to be simplified and uh, need to be ensured that they reach to the potential uh, women. Uh, on the other hand, I also see patriarchal uh, structure uh, that affects other sectors also affect to uh, women entrepreneurship in Nepal. Basically, be it uh, in the access to capital, control over capital, control over decision making, though constitution has now allowed us to access to uh, property age equal to men, very, very few women who have access to that at the moment. It's still a long way to go to claim that. Uh, so the capital and uh, capital is one thing. And another thing is, you know, the mobility because of the gender norms. We do have uh, constant mobility compared to men. And constant mobility means you also have constant exposure to the world. And exposure and mobility aids on confidence. So if you are constrained because of the gender norms, then you cannot exercise the right that you have because you cannot build on the confidence that is required for the business community. Um, another challenge that I see is tremendous pressure on unpaid care work that women are doing. At the moment, I, I've seen, I salute those women who have you know, done very, very well in the entrepreneurship, but they are also doing the same work in the household as unpaid uh, care work. Uh, we have very limited thoughts on how to share the unpaid care work of women so that women can have more quality time to invest in entrepreneurship, which is not an easy task uh, for women. Um, for me, the state needs to make more investment, not only the state, but even the family members need to make more investment to release women um, from this uh, burden of uh, 
uh, on paid care work. That is another challenge that I see. The market it is still dominated by men. So market requires network. Market requires exposure. Market requires skill. Market requires time. And these are, if you compare these things between men and women, women are constrained to, to exercise their access to market. So market is still dominated by men. Mm -hmm. um, some women entrepreneurs say, men can sell their products very easily. Even the products are inferior from the age of women they produce. Because this is related to network, this is related to confidence, this is related to mobility, and this is related to exposure and confidence. So these are a few challenges that, that I uh, see. Uh, but we have very good um, legislations, very good policies, very good programs. This huge gap I see is actual implementation and reaching out to the women, uh, potential women, because sometimes we see those who are not potentials, who are less experienced, who have less you know, uh, capacity, the, the schemes reach there. But who are more potentials, schemes are somewhere you know, lost in between. So we need to work on that as well. Thank you. Great, thank you. Let's um, now turn to our two investors on the panel, Srini and, and Sid. Um, Srini, CDC is the UK's development finance institution, has a portfolio of roughly $5 billion in investments across Africa and Asia today. And Sid, you are about a $14 million private equity fund investing solely in Nepali businesses here today. We've heard from Dr. Bimla um, some of the challenges that women face in terms of as access to assets, entrepreneurship, confidence, etc. Um, and of course, you have a room full of women entrepreneurs, so I would be careful <laughs> what you say. But um, Srini, to start with you, what is CDC um, hearing from the businesses that you invest in, your pipeline, regarding their gender progressive practices? So not necessarily just to invest in women-owned businesses, but even men-owned businesses can do more to make workplaces women-friendly, to provide um, support for training, um, and to address some of the challenges that Dr. Bimala mentioned. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Shubha. I think the most important thing in my mind is, see, we work across South Asia, is the level of consciousness about this issue should go up substantially. Mm -hmm. I mean, today it's not even a boardroom conversation, right. forget about action really. So the fact that every company should have a women director should be made mandatory whether it's listed or unlisted, at least at CDC, we take that very seriously. Mm -hmm. Unless it becomes a part of the boardroom conversation, it's very difficult to percolate it down the line. So we started a program called Boardroom Africa, and uh, where we, 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 we are really targeting to get women directors, because it's very difficult to find senior women directors within our region. It's because we never trained them over a period of time. So the first important thing is for the management to take this as a part of their mission. Second important point is I think investors like us have a very key role to play in making sure that in board meetings, we make this an agenda item. At CDC, we do that. And I, in fact, personally myself, I take every board meeting 10 minutes towards the end in any other business, and I take two slides to say, what are you doing about gender? Mm -hmm. The people sitting in the room, there's only one woman, there's a lady director. That's important. Second, third important thing here is, there is something called unconscious bias within our markets. I mean, I work across South Asia. You know, it's very difficult for, it's still very difficult for, as she rightly pointed out, for male-driven entrepreneurs to trust a lady in terms of you know, kind of sharing their thought process, sharing their ideas, that is real unconscious bias. Mm -hmm. So we run a training program called Unconscious Bias. So the unconscious bias is when you walk into a room full of people, you already made up your mind, I can relate to this person, this person, this person, but not these two. Mm -hmm. Your mind is already there. So I think we run programs with companies, in fact, in CDC initially, and now we are planning to take it to companies how do we take out the element of unconscious bias and keep a slightly open mind towards this? Because I think, honestly, in South Asia, including Nepal, there's a lot of grassroots work to be done. I'll finish it in two minutes. <laughs> um, the third important thing is, you know, as, as the, the government officials pointed out, access to formal credit is a very difficult thing today. And we are in the absence of documentation, in the absence of collateral, in the absence of a record of having paid institutions in the past, I think most important point where we start is skill development for women. Mm -hmm. So we are doing that. We are starting that in India. We'll take it to Nepal, Bangladesh, and Pakistan. 
to make sure that there is a skill development for women. I, I, they are, you know, so I mean, unless we are able to give a safeguard policy, particularly on child care and conditions of service, we are facing that in Bangladesh garment sector today. Safeguarding is an issue, to be honest with you. We are doing our own surveys, and we are trying to take it to the owners of the business and tell them, actually, there is a harassment going on in your company. Are you aware of it? Some of them deny. Mm -hmm. Some of them say, yeah, I'm aware of it, really. But it's very difficult for promoters to step up and take that action. Mm -hmm. It stops with our telling them, but we say we'll stop funding you if you don't take action, really. It's very, very critical. Mm -hmm. The last point I just want to mention about is, look, we need to approach gender inequality with hard data. Yeah. Today I find that gender inequality are based on anecdotal evidence or cursory surveys. This is my perception, hence I'm taking this step. Like you take business decisions, you have to have hard data, otherwise you won't take this seriously at all. Mm -hmm. So that's our perception in terms. Mm -hmm. We're doing a lot of work in terms mm -hmm. of 2x challenges and in terms of Boardroom Africa. There's a gender finance collaboration with 15 other DFIs which we are chairing, etc. Uh, if you ask me, we are still in an infancy, but we are trying very hard. The first thing is to practice ourselves. So we have a lot of women directors within CDC, and we are trying to increase it further. Great, thank you. Um, and, and turning to uh, Sid now, you know, as a local investor in local SMEs, you know the reality on the ground here. Um, I think Srini has, has spoken about the challenges, you know, at the boardroom level, at the investment level, at the un unconscious bias level. But how would you compare the experiences of investing in men-owned businesses versus women-owned businesses here? How progressive are also the local businesses in your pipeline about gender inclusion and leadership by women? Just uh, one second. Mike, please. Yeah. Gender sp specific constraints are across the board, whether it's for men or for women. But then what, through my experience, what I find is that there are constraints between the rural sector with SM, uh, micro small enterprises and with uh, urban, semi-urban sector with SMEs. Okay? Uh, I think my own experience is that uh, the rural w uh, sector with micro small enterprises the women are far ahead because there are group support levels um, there are group um, guarantees uh, the women are not alone see when we f look at the urban sector uh, the women are entrepreneurs all by herself there are no support systems uh, access to finance is even much difficult here in the urban sector than it is in the rural parts mm -hmm. of nepal and in our experience after going through thousands of companies in the pipeline realize that you know very few really do make it to financial closure. And the ones who do make it to financial closure um, have someone from the family who's a male, even though he's, he is not a part of that original uh, process of starting the company, that male presence is there. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's either the confidence, confidence level of the, uh, the, the woman in question or um, the financing has come from the uh, from bootstrapping until we enter the business. So now, I must ins uh, emphasize that it's just been three or four years that a new asset class has been um, um, brought to Nepal through Business Oxygen Private Limited, which uh, DFID is uh, very much an investor with IFC and S a Strategic Climate Fund. And what we do is we realize that um, capital is not just the only um, constraint. It is the technical capacity that brings, uh, that which is brought in with the, um, with the capital into the business to increase the capacity of not only the entrepreneur but also the business. Mm -hmm. So we work in a very hand-holding capacity, and this has really helped. Uh, but you know, this has to be multiplied several thousand times to make a big difference. So we are trying to do that, but getting women entrepreneurs with the sort of business plan that fits our investment profile is very far and few in between. So now to, to answer your second question, to give you some figures, out of the portfolios that we've invested in, 23% of direct employment that uh, benefits the companies are women. That is a 250% increase in the company's gender, women uh, employment since our investment got in. And in the value chain, so especially in the supply chain, there is a four time uh, increase. So, you know, it's not about uh, the companies which are averse to employing women. 
It's just that they have to be made aware why they uh, can make a huge a difference by getting women employment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. I mean, I think both of you brought up some interesting points also about you know, the data and the proof uh, about the differences in investing in both businesses, in both women versus men-owned businesses, which I'll come back to. But now I want to turn to the actual businesses here. Um, you've heard the government, you've heard investors speak uh, about you know, what they face as businesses. Um, and uh, let me start with Anupama, who's the CEO of Mega Bank here, and then with Melody, who's working with Nepali businesses in partnership here in Hydropower. So Anupama, tell us the reality on the ground. I mean, as the CEO of a leading bank here, and based on what you've heard, what do you think is still needed to create progress for women entrepreneurs? Thank you, Suva. Actually, I want to say, women in business is definitely going to take the country for prosperity. Unless we have women business being developed, being supported, whatever prosperity we are talking about is going to be half only. So. As a banker, we support women in business. But the entire picture in Nepal reflects that you know, we have 922 firms registered in Nepal, but only 14% of the business is owned by women. Mm -hmm. Time has come for us women to take the lead, understand that we have to push ourselves. We have to think big. Those already in the business, successful people, they have to make sure that they grow, and new freshers will have to look up to the successful people. Their stories need to be reiterated, and they should be coming up, they should be forthcoming. They say that, you know, while doing business also, or any um, uh, running a company, men ask four times more than women to fulfill their needs. So we have to realize that we have to come forth. We have to make sure that we start asking. If we look into the international data also, you know, only 9% of the percent women CEOs are there. We are a developing nation, definitely. Women are not there in the boardroom where decisions take place. I don't talk about small businesses only. Look into the big corporates that are here in Nepal. Very few better halves, women, are there in the boardroom. We have to start this culture. Unless we start it now, we'll never reach no anywhere. You know, the gender gap that we're talking about in the world, uh, it's close to 32%, and they say that it'll take another 108 years to fulfill this gap. Imagine where we are in Nepal. As very well reflected, 2006 Nepal was uh, rated 111th country in the ge uh, gender gap analysis. In 2018, we are rated 105. That means policies are there, you know, regulations are there. Government has come out with lots of subsidies for women. Equivalently, our central bank has also come out with the subsidized products, interest rate subsidies. Now we have to take that to the women that are needy. I've come in a meeting, I've, I've uh, been in a, in a seminars where women organizations have brought in many women entrepreneurs from all the districts of Nepal. We talk about the products, we talk about everything, but at the end, how many of those women come into banking? That is the question. We have to take note of the numbers. We have to assure wherever we are, we keep on making sure that women entrepreneurs have the financial access. For Mega Bank and for the banking sector, we have gone to rural areas now. DFID has supported our uh, rural branches and they have supported to bring up branchless banking. The banks have reached the rural areas and the unbanked populace. Now the time is to lit, you know, spread literacy. Financial literacy is very important, and we have not done much there. So I think time has come for all of us to open our eyes and say that we have to together think big. We can start small, but we have to think big. And united, we are unstoppable. We united, we ladies, we women are not beatable.
time has come to prove that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think as you brought up, um, certainly, you know, it's it's not just an issue in Nepal. It's a global issue, um, whether it's the U.S., the U.K., uh, anywhere in South Asia. I mean, women lag behind on so many uh, indicators. So let me now turn to um, Melody, who comes from China and is working in partnership uh, with Nepali businesses here. Melody, what is your experience as a Chinese investor? And also, what is happening in China regarding the progress of women in business? I think it's on? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Suba. Uh, firstly, I would like to say I was so honored and thrilled to be invited for this session. And um, yeah, I would like to share my experience because uh, I'm from China, it's quite different. Um, firstly, uh, the first question is my uh, our experience as investor in China, working with Nepalese. We are a hydropower uh, company. Yes, our company is mostly in energy and infra infrastructure fields. For those, these fields, so women involvement is less than tertiary industry and other service sectors. So women survived very hard in this business. But we do have very good experience working with our Nepali partners, especially female employees. We have several Nepali um, partners. They have um, women, female employees. They are manager, engineer, also uh, business promoters. Um, they are really, we have very good, very, very good, very good relationship, working relationship with them, and they showed very good quality during the working. Um, they are really um, honesty, careful, accurate, and very responsible. These are very good quality and characters for Nepali female employees. And mostly, most important thing is uh, all these uh, female employees are very competent for their work. Um, for the second question, what happened in China for the regarding the progress of the women um, in business? Actually, it's uh, in general saying it's quite a different story from uh, other countries. Um, everybody knows after 1949, the pa People Republic of China was founded, and China was very poor at that stage. So the government encouraged w women to work, go out the house, go out of the home, and to start work. So, so women gradually uh, came out from the house and start to work as women in dependency was called upon from the Communist Party. So when I was a little girl, you know, um, my mother uh, was working, so I, in my simple mind, you know, the woman working is a very simple thing. It's very normal, you know. Both parents have to work, otherwise you cannot support the family. So, but after these years, there's fast developing happened in China, and the Chinese people having better not life now. The, some Ch women start to come back home, to stay at home. So I don't think the women come back home is a backward of the woman development in business. Because on contrary, I think this is more progress happen because women have rights to choose to make it their own decision to say, I want to stay in business or I want back home. Have I answered your question? Yes, <laughs> thank you very much. So I have one more question for the panel in general. So whoever uh, can answer, please, please chime in. And I think that some of you will want to. And then I will open it to the floor. Um, so we've, we've heard a lot, you know, as Srini, as, as you were saying, about anecdotes. You know, we've, we've got the stories, women entrepreneurs coming up, you know, we've seen the change. 
But one of the questions that businesses, certainly ones that I, I talk to um, that you know, may say it privately is, it costs money to invest in women, more than men. It costs money to overcome this difference, um, to trust them, to let, make them take risks. So what is the proof that investing in women is good for business? Sure. Well, being a banker, we have financed a lot of women. We've financed 26,000 women in micro and SME banking. So what I have realized in three, this three decades of my uh, service in financial sector, uh, there are two things that women do it very well. That's why investing in women is pro profitable than investing in men. I'm assured of that. One, women are very honest. They have a very high level of integrity. And when you invest in them, the default rate that you see in an organization, because we look into risk very seriously, is close to zero. So why not women in, uh, invest in women and entrepreneurs? The other most important thing is that we look for profit, and they are willing to pay more. Mm -hmm. So there's a return to your investment also. So these two things really reflect that when we invest in women, it is more po profitable. And if you talk about uh, the empirical studies, you know, women-led organizations, they create f 10 to 15 percent more profit than men-led organizations. So we have to take this into consideration. And I really believe, as you said, Suba, changes are required. Now for us, what I see ahead, because I'm a banker, I talk in numbers, I love numbers, and it's very easy to understand. There are few numbers that need to change, and we have to aspire for that. The first and foremost is the right to immovable property, okay? If we look into Nepal, it's only 10%. Women only hold 10% of that. Change this number. As I said, we have 922,000 firms registered in Nepal. Only 14% of the women are the owners. Change this number. There are 111,000 SME businesses registered in Nepal. Only 12% are owned by women. Let's change this number. If we talk about literacy, 62% of the women are literate, whereas 80% of men are literate in Nepal. Let's change this number. I think changes are required there, and women together can do it. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. The rest I, of the panel, Srini? <laughs> I would say four, four important things, uh, Shobha. One is we have financed 10 million women within our entire microfinance universe in South Asia and 99% recovery, unless the men behind the women default, they don't default. If they don't let them have the money. Mm. They have found that they come in time for the center meetings, they're very diligent, they tell you where the money has gone, what business they're doing. They don't lie. Mm. That's the most important thing. Second thing is organizations, organizations should tackle this in two forms. One is at the senior level, we need boardroom, boardroom South Asia, mm -hmm. where we bring in senior women. And unless we are taking a conscious effort, as I said earlier, into the boards. Second thing is what we run in CDC is called uh, the Environmental Social Governance Committee, mm -hmm. of which the women uh, is, 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 is taken as a very important topic. As uh, she pointed out, it's very, uh, it's very important to talk about financial literacy programs for them. It's important to talk about entrepreneurship for them. Mm -hmm. And uh, as they mature from uh, group borrowing into an individual borrower, mm -hmm. We should make sure that we are able to finance them through the curve mm. and not let them halfway because they suddenly go and can't go into a banking system because they don't have the collateral. Mm. So it's important that you know, NBFCs is what we call them, the non-bank mm. finance institutions. They are the only ones who are going to deliver credit and banks are not going to. I can tell you that. Mm. We've seen this across South Asia. So the non-bank finance companies in Nepal have to be encouraged more by the government. They, they are the ones, if you give them target, they will deliver. And they are the ones who have got the risk appetite. Banks, I find that banks are playing a very critical role, but I think coming down the value chain is still very challenging for them because the cost income ratio for them is substantially higher as opposed to an NBFC. Mm. The third point I just want to say here is that I think unless we are bringing women in employment in our investee companies, 
they can't change women. It's yeah. very difficult to expect men to change women. Mm -hmm. So I think we are taking very conscious to have all women branches yeah, ac across our NBFCs because lending is the most genesis of this in my view. All women branches, women in employment to make sure that they are able to, but you have to give them a lot of training, safeguarding, and uh, make sure that they are protected well, really, and they feel safe about their jobs. So we are taking very conscious efforts to bring in all women branches so that they are able to explain to them better. Mm -hmm. Great. Please, thank you for that, Trini. Your question is interesting. Uh, for me, men and women are different. They do have different capabilities. It's not about who is good and who is bad. Men have certain capabilities, skills, that women might not have, and women have certain capabilities and skills that men might not have. We need both. But actually, the problem is about overvaluing men's capability and undervaluing women's capability. This is the problem today. So we just want to reverse that, but we want to make a complementing world. You know, men's capability complementing women's capability, similarly women's complementing men's. Because it's 50% population. Without investing on women's, the 51% population, how do you grow? So that's the question. Uh, for me, you know, the, again, the, the challenge is, first is the comp uh, our perception on competence. If we see women in one position, ourselves, we ask ourselves, can I do this job? And society also starts asking, can she do that job? And if in the same position a man comes in, no one questions whether he can do that job. So we need to change that mindset. Yeah. So another important thing that I see, and I will do, because I, I, I believe in this, is that we were taught in school, we were given an education in, in such a way that after getting certificate, we seek for job. We don't create employment, but we seek for job. Usually, men are you know, told from the beginning that, look, you need to earn. You need to you know, take care of your family. And for women, if we are sent in school, if we have higher education, we get CV and we look for job. We don't create job. Mm -hmm. So I think we need to change this now, for women especially, for girls. We need to you know, teach them entrepreneurship from the school age. And for me, I don't you know, ask my daughter to get a better job. I ask my daughter to create a job and how to do that. This is more important for women at the moment. So it's, it's about changing <laughs> perception and changing the mindset. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Any other comments? Um, just to add to my fellow panelists, um, we are a, a sector agnostic gender neutral fund. Uh, but our mandate is to see that there is um, uh, inclusivity. There has to be certain amount of women in the, in the various investments that we make. But having said that, uh, you know, the social cost of default is greater in the minds of women. They do not, uh, they don't, uh, arguably, they do not default uh, intentionally. And uh, from our experience, the, the balance sheets that come to us for a review, uh, it's quite clear that you know they have done their best they haven't tried to hide their balance sheets but one of the biggest problems here for me which I have intimated to many of you who, who are in the audience we've sort of interacted on this in ver various other for forums that there aren't that many um, um, in the pipeline that come to our attention see we'd love to increase our portfolio of women uh, investees but um, there's just very few uh, and we'd like to see that happen. But another thing is, yes, equity is always more ex expensive than going to a bank to get a loan. But loans are very difficult to be had. Equity, we do not take collateral, we do not take security. So this is a new sort of idea that we need to make aware among our uh, women investees that there is an asset class that is available that can help you scale up. So let's see how that goes in the future. Great, thank you, thank you everybody. So now let me open it to the floor for some questions. I think there will be a mic going around. Um, we have one question at the back, a gentleman Suva? there. Maybe what we can do. Suva? Yep. I think Dr. Rajan Bhatra wants to oh, say something. Oh, sorry. I didn't see that. <laughs> sorry. Can I just add one more thing? I think the 
documents or legislation pro legislator i mean the pro provision in our laws or constitutions and the translating into the practice i think the gap that we have been facing not only maybe in the women's part but in a whole i mean in our process in our system but that we all need to make joint efforts otherwise if we look into the governments or the formal institutions to do the business and if we keep idle i don't think that is going to mm -hmm. happen even we have a very good provisions mm -hmm. so there are some provisions in mandatory but some provisions which we have say make some of the provisions for you know women's friendly or subsidies or tax rebates and all these things first let them know that where what are these facilities that is specific for the women mm -hmm. the second thing is also educate i think the education is very important and i see in this room many of you are the mothers and how often we discuss this sort of things with our daughter at our home mm -hmm. during our dining table maybe during our breakfast whenever we join together how many times how long we spend this sort of things that i think starts from the very beginning because when we talk about the cultural things and traditional things we have been I mean, ground up in a way that you are a man, you are a boy, you are supposed to do it this way. You are a girl, you are supposed to do it this way. This sort of very, you know, stereotype of definition about the gender in our house, in our mindset, unless we change that. I think even we make a very good, you know, documents, or even we prosper economically, but cultural things, that not that does not overcome we can see some of the countries even in some of the very advanced asian countries the gender gap despite their economic boom despite their economic development we still can see their gap and that discrimination so that for that the cultural thing and the very beginning of our house i think home that we have to start that's what i would like to add on that definitely definitely no that's a very important point and i think we're all aware of that having lived through that ourselves um so i think there are a few questions what we'll do is collect two or three questions and then uh, um, uh pose them to the panel and then depending on time we'll we'll see where we go um so i think wow <laughs> the mic uh right over there Hello everyone, I'm Ching Ching from Hong Kong. Um, I'm international director of Idea for Nepal. Uh, I would like to uh, raise a question that, uh, because I would see that like so far we have a lot of discussion on women in business or work field, but I would say there is another very important factor that affecting the empowerment uh, of women or whether like we have the strength or we have the ability to do like to function or to do very good in work but still the family role and position uh, of women somehow also affecting uh, the empowerment of women uh, I can see because I'm from Hong Kong to be honest like uh, I would say women in Hong Kong is quite independent like uh, we are quite available to be like fully participate uh, in work mm. because I might uh, have to ask you to get to the question because we are running yeah, out of time yeah. so uh, because we have a lot of social policies or social institutions uh, to support women to be away from home somehow or to you know uh, not to be the main caretaker of the family so uh, but I can see in Nepal is pretty like different uh, it's still the family role of women is still very strong that they look like the only caretaker of the home and then for kids for the housework or sorry for Ching Ching, I might have to so, interrupt you uh, what is you know what is yeah, the question so what is the like advice or suggestions uh, on social policies or social practice mm -hmm. in the way to change the uh, to, uh, to make the women more available to be empowered Thank you. Thank you. We'll collect two more questions, uh, maybe one in the middle here. <laughs> um, or perhaps over to the gentleman there and then to the lady in the middle here. And then we'll come back uh, for another um, round. Um, 
Thank you. Okay. <laughs> uh, I'm Shambhadan Shrestha. And uh, <clears throat> if we can, um, just one, one second, if we can just get to the question, because I think we are running out of time. The question is about um, to Dr. Uh, Bimala. It's not actually a question, it's my experience. I do my business in natural fibers in the districts with rural women. And those rural women, it's a big impact when you work with the rural women. And the rural women have, have their skill. The nature is there to provide the raw material. And then that also impacts the environment. And it is about traditional crafts. I'm into the craft business. And the traditional craft, linking with the traditional craft in the villages, makes a lot of difference to the families and to the whole society in the village and everyone else. Mm -hmm. But it is not tackled because all, almost all of the women are from the lower status of the society. They know all kinds of skills, traditional skills, and those are all creative. If we can market those products, which I have been doing for more than 35 years, it's a huge impact. Why don't we look at that sector and then empower the people in the village, empower the socio-economic condition of Nepal, and also preserve our culture as well as environment. It's very important for, Thank for you. everyone else, I, I think. Thank, Thank you very Thank much. Thank you so much. So one question on conditions in the household, one question on the uh, rural um, situation. And I think there was a gentleman at the back with the mic. Yes, go ahead. Hello. Yes. I am Ravi Raghupati, uh, Healthy Relationship Ambassador Australia, and also National Chair and Founder of Australia India Business Organization. My question to Federal MP, and I would like to raise the question in upcoming Parliament session. One voice, the advisor is sitting here, and everyone, that I would like to kind notice that our Victorian Premier in the world introduced the first time 50% women ministers in the parliament. So I would like to request everyone and to create a one voice to get literacy and Mr. Srini has noticed so many things and what the voice the MP can raise and you were uh, influence for the women all sitting here so that they can become a minister in the Nepal government. Thank you. Thank you. So let's just hear, so, sorry. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Uh, my name is Mona Shrestha. I represent uh, my consulting firm which is called Emerge. We're talking about numbers here and it's getting very interesting. I would like to applaud the organizers, SODF and the UK Aid. If you see the numbers here, we have three women speakers and three men. So can we have a big round of applause for this gender sensitive uh, team here? We rarely see this here, uh, nor do we see it at the international community. I have two issues. One is on the data. Everybody has talked about it. Uh, my, my question is, if we look globally, if you see five, among five companies, there's only one company that is owned by women that exports. Let us imagine the future. Now we see that there's a lot of great initiatives from the government, private sector is joining hands, we have a lot of investment coming in, but what do we do with the women entrepreneurs? The, the question is, how can we leverage uh, to scale in order to have more investment on women entrepreneurs, in order to build their skills, particularly in this world of the fourth industrial revolution, where uh, trading is uh, taking place in a different form. It's, it's moving from the traditional brick and mortar to the e-commerce. So how can we get that more investment? Thank you. Thank you. 
So maybe I'll, I'll turn to the panel um, to respond to those questions. Um, and again, I'm, I'm so sorry. There's so many questions and so many great insights. I wish we had almost three times the time. Um, uh, I have to be a bit militant about time. But if the panelists could respond to the questions as you wish, um, one on what needs to change in the home uh, in order, I think this is what you were speaking about before. I think one question was just on one voice. One question was on the rural conditions, and of course, um, the last question on how we can leverage for growth. So whoever wants to respond, short. <laughs> Please. Um, I want to try very short. Uh, first, balancing uh, professional work and uh, unpaid care work. Um, this is very important, as I uh, said earlier as well. I see uh, two, um, two types, two prong strategies for that. One, I always advocate that if women are released from the burden of unpaid care work, they can be more engaged in productive work and this not only benefits women but also benefits the whole country because 51% more labor force in productive sector means growth in GDP. So this message needs to go throughout and I advocate state, basically state and society to invest on unpaid care work. Maybe child care center, maybe a good birthing center, nearby services, maybe giving washing machine to all women. If I was the policy maker, I would do that. But you know, these are the things that releases workload of women, one aspect. Second aspect is about sharing the job, sharing the work. And for that, I think now we need to challenge men. How? Usually, what I feel is I'm equally good in, at home working on, on, care, on paid care work, and I'm equally good in corporate and professional sector. Men are maybe good in professional and corporate sector, but very bad still in the home. So can women take this challenge to, to learn something from the unpaid care work? So this is a challenge that we may need to uh, ask to, women, to men and make them more responsive also. Uh, so uh, that would be the two strategies that uh, would work. It has worked some time at, at my home. And the, 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 the second um, question was about uh, rural women. I, I fully um, agree that rural women not only contribute on economic development, but also make communities and home resilience. It's, it's, it's all the resilience that has come is from the rural women that we see, because they, they manage a household, they manage community, as well as they make it resilient from the external force. I do fully agree on that. And government has several schemes to support rural women. But the main challenge is in implementation. And we need to focus more on implementation, making women's access to information, and helping them, facilitating them, mentoring them to claim the benefits that has been announced by the government. So I think this is, a, and social capital is very important. In many rural, rural villages, we do have women cooperative, which are very, very important uh, vehicles to empower women collectively. Uh, so that would be uh, one of the way to promote. Um, the, the, third, uh, the third question, um, that was like, uh, what was the third question? Ah, how to increase the number of um, women minister. I do have my advisor uh, to prime minister <laughs> here. So I think this question should uh, be there, <laughs> not me. But I think uh, it's, it's a very good question. Um, in Nepal constitution says in all state structure, there should be 33% women. So cabinet is one of these structures, important structure, and should have it. But I think we also need to think about where did we start from. In the one decade, we have made very good progress on women's you know, participation in the parliament, in the local government, at every level, in the bureaucracy in all the independent structures, so in the corporate sector. So I think we need to acknowledge the change, the progress that we have made. And uh, having more ministers, women ministers is important, number is important, but number is not always sufficient to make influence. Even having more number of MPs could make more influence than having number of uh, uh, women ministers sometimes. So I think balancing in number is one thing. We need to make government and the political parties more accountable to, to what uh, constitutional provision is. On the other hand, we need to improve the skills, capacities, and influencing capacity of women leaders, not only in the political parties, but also in the ministry and MPs itself. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Thank you. 
And, and I think we also have a comment from Ms. Pramilaji. Mike? <laughs> Um. Uh, my question is that, you know, there is not one single woman from the private sector in the parliament in that 33% representation. Uh, surprisingly, there are quite a number of men from the private sector representing in the House. So why is it that, you know, we talk about business, we talk about, you know, active participation of women, but uh, if we are really to have the voice of women, when it comes to entrepreneurship, that is missing. So I think that is something we have to look into, and we have to have the representation of women from the private sector in policy making levels, that's the parliament, in the legislative body. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So I've just been told by the organizers that we're really, really running out of time. Um, and I'm afraid we, we will have to, to wrap up here. But as I mentioned, there is a high tea afterwards just around the corner in Garden Tea. So I encourage all of you all to pounce upon these panelists and ask them all your amazing questions. So just as we wrap up, maybe we can hear a very, very brief from all of the panelists on your final thoughts. Um, and then I will just sort of wrap up and hand over to Pramila Ji to close the event. Go ahead. Thank you, Suva. What I would like to say is that a, a pertinent question was raised. Why uh, women can't be freed from their household job and then go become an entrepreneur or do their job, do whatever they want? I really believe that in Nepal, uh, as I talked about education and literacy, we in the urban sector also, and in the rural areas also, we women will have to realize that we should not be saving money for our daughter's wedding anymore. We should be able to invest in our daughter's education rather. Give them the platform. We have to assure of that. And once our daughters are educated, they will create wonders in the world. The other thing I would like to say is that we uh, mega bank. We have 43% um, women participation in senior management level, and 43%, close to 43% in uh, women hiring, if you see the numbers. So I really believe that there are women coming up. There are lots of men who have left the country, but women are here studying and aspiring for future in Nepal. We'll have to take care of that will have to support them. And one uh, woman, she raised that, you know, we're talking about numbers, and uh, if she wants to expand her business, what is the possibilities? Mm -hmm. We really have to assure that when we are trying to grow big, we have to bring in fresh blood into our organization. We are going digitization, big on digitization. We have to add in fresh blood to our companies, and aspire to grow big. There are investments available, but you have to be confident that you have to be able to present the financials well. Thank you. And for that, you need to work a little bit more. Our hands is out there. Put up your hands, we're there. We'll work together. Great, thank you. Final brief, brief, brief comment. <laughs> I don't have a specific comment. Um, I see a lot of uh, wonderful uh, women who have made their own space. Uh, wish you good luck all the time. And uh, um, as a member of parliament, what I uh, see important is uh, how inclusive our policy making uh, process is. Uh, having an MP, having a women MP is important uh, from the sector, but it's also important that when the policies are drafted, um, whether the stakeholders are consulted, whether, whether their concerns have been incorporated right from the beginning when the policy drafting takes place. So this is where we need to be cautious and we need to be proactive because no one is coming with information, with the skills and with, with equipments uh, to help us. It's us who need to be more proactive. And um, as an MP, I'm always ready to listen to you and uh, to uh, my job. Uh, 
uh, want to be accountable to, the, to, to, to you all and let's keep, it, keep the spirit on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I will just respond to questions, specific questions in regards to why we have a less women's ministers compared to the parliamentarians and many other bureaucratic I mean, structures. I think, yes, we have to accept the number is less than the compared to many other areas. But what I think, we are in a stage, you know, very primary stage. We have achieved those things now and we are working towards better improvement of the women's participation, even the, the most senior level. And I think this will have to be done, though it's not a mandatory, but in coming days, you will see this improvement into the cabinet of the government, and that is what the Prime Minister himself thinks about it. So I can say about it up to now, this issue. The second thing is about the private sectors. Yes, I think the private sector, especially the women's representation inside the parliament, is no more there. And again, this, we have a 33 percent. Women, despite that, the entrepreneurs' representation seems not there. So I think it's also the sort of, you know, doing lobby or inside the political parties that if you do not provide this entrepreneurship, I mean, representation inside the parliament, that means you are not representing our views and you are not, you know, allowing us to hear or say our views inside the parliament and policy levels. I think through that also, we need to do that, maybe coming elections. The third thing, what I would say is that I agree with uh, our CEO, Megabank CEO, that education, education, education. That's the only thing that if we focus, if we want to improve the women's leadership in all areas, that's the only way we can do it and let's do and let's start it. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'll keep it very short. <laughs> I think there are three things. Number one is empowerment. Two is literacy. And I think we have to, when we conduct town halls and specified sessions in villages in, for example, in Bihar and in Orissa, we are doing it in 600 villages. We pull people out of the villages and ask them to come and attend. They are a little bit shy, and, but they do have, when other people attend, they do tend to come. Mm -hmm. But when they come and attend it on the financial literacy, they really understand. So I think we have to really draw people out and ask them to go through this. And the third important thing is there are very distinguished women here, and I think, please, ask for more rights in the board, and people like us will support you. Thank you, thank you. Okay, one of the last questions that uh, was brought up earlier was how do we get financing? I just want to let you know, I want to reiterate what I said earlier, is that there is private equity. We are here. If you don't want to come talk to me, my company has 55% women. So between uh, Mega Bank and Business Oxygen, we, we're doing better than the parliament in inclusiveness. So. There is uh, funds to be had. You need to understand that, you know, of course, it has to meet our criteria, but uh, we, are, we would like to see a bigger portfolio of our investments in women. Right now, it's just 10%. I'd like to make it 50, 60%. Uh, so come talk to us. Money is there. Uh, we give you technical assistance too. So it's a hand-holding pro process. So, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a long relationship. Thank you. I think it is, I'm the only foreign woman on the panel, <laughs> so no, I just. He's also there. <laughs> well, I'm Sri Lankan. Oh so. yeah, <laughs> you you are mandatory, right? <laughs> so I I speak uh, from the woman perspective. Um, I think women have should be self-conscious and aware what they want, and also, so social system and social organization and the policies should come along to help them to build up those ideas, to be aware of their potentials and the talents, to help them for education, training, etc., and giving them opportunities for self-development. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you. you. So just to wrap up, before I hand over to Pramila Ji, we've heard some you know, great insights. There's clearly a lot happening, much more than in some other countries around the world. There's clearly a lot to be done. There's a lot of energy and a lot of drive in the room, um, I'm sure, throughout the country as well. 
Um, we will be producing a report here on the discussion as well as some video content, um, and then we hope to take that conversation forward. Um, just, I guess, a thank you from my side to the Investment Board of Nepal, the UK Department for International Development, and last but not least, this, you know, Pramila Ji was talking about how, you know, rapidly this event came together, but she was being very modest about her own effort. Uh, this really came together through her entire energy overnight. We wouldn't be here without her. So I just want to say a big thank you to Sadaf and to Pramila Ji. And, to, you, you know, I'll turn the mic over <laughs> to close the event. Oh, okay, it's working. <laughs> Oh, well, lastly, I'd like to thank you all for being part of this important session because you heard it from Suva. But next time, what we have to do is we have to plan it in advance because I want you all to benefit from this session. I don't want the Women in Business Summit uh, session just to be, you know, a room where we discuss our challenges and opportunities. We should also have opportunities to, to meet investors, to look into future collaborations, and also to make it happen that when we come out of this such events, that we have gained something. I think that might not happen this time, but let me assure you that this is the beginning. Because bringing this women in business, you know, it happened at the 11th hour, but it has happened, and you all are here. And I think having an exclusive session on women in business is something that we have all achieved together. So let's make it larger next, next time. Let's grow together. And I'd like to thank all the panelists. You know, you all are great influencers and contributors. And I think together we need to work. Thank you all for being part of this session. Thank you, everybody. And we have the high tea over at Garden Cafe. So we'll see you there. <laughs>